welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode six. Universal Vehicle, Buddha, Einstein, and Wittgenstein. Science is stuck now. You know, Western science is stuck. It thinks it's the only science, which it definitely isn't. But Western science is stuck because in 1926, the hard physicists, the hardest of all physicists, the quantum physicists, said, working quantum physicists, the one whose work eventually led to the destruction of the atom and the atom bombs, they proclaimed, they discovered that there is no intrinsic reality in any particle. There is no intrinsic objectivity because Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, at the very micro level of observation, the act of observation by a person's subjectivity influences the object that is being uh, measured or observed. So there's no absolute objectivity because the subjectivity is interacting with it. So therefore, since 1926, scientifically, it was proven that the mind is a force in nature, that the subjective mind cannot be ruled out. It is not objective, in other words, to disregard the existence of the subjective mind. And yet that is just what is done, even in psychology, which is study of the mind. There's, no, there's supposed to be no subjectivity. No first-person testimony is, is interesting. There's a guy called Wunsch, Wunsch in Germany, who decided that first-person reports were useless and that nobody understood themselves. So you shouldn't talk to anybody about themselves. You have to somehow reduce their mental activities to something you can measure, and everybody else will see it the same way because it's just an objective, and there's no subjective bias involved in seeing it. So that's the whole thing. Even psychology and every science is stuck because they want pure objectivity, and they are not existing. Finally, Thomas Nagel, downtown here at NYU, he wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, very respected philosopher. He said, you guys, in your attempt to reduce reality to pure matter, and through materialistic reductionism, explain everything, including the workings of the mind, are doomed to failure because you're in denial of the instrument you're working with, which is your mind. <laughs> you're in denial that it exists. So you're completely barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> totally. And billions invested. This whole your neuroscience frenzy, what do you think that is? That's not some, that's not just, they're not trying to cure cancer. They're trying to prove that you know, some drug is, every bit of your consciousness is a chemical. And therefore, they'll find exactly what they are, and then they'll put that in your head, and then you'll be happy, sad, alive, dead, whatever, because you're reducible to some chemical activities. Even some of the acid heads in the 60s thought that. Therefore, they were like after their drugs, because they thought the drugs were the enlightenment. <laughs> wow, that drug talks to me. They did, which it isn't, never was. And therefore, they, they, got, they became like malnourished. So the mind is part of it. So in the epistemological level, there's no intrinsic objectivity. So our sense that that object ha is, is independently established as a pillar out of its own pillarhood out of its own pillar essence, etc., is illusory. Our sense of its massive facticity is illusory. 
it's an illusion. Okay? And then finally, the subtlest level where they haven't, where, where they reached in 1926, but as a whole, they are not into it. They're stuck, even the psychologists. It's called, it's the most subtle one called, I call it, intrinsic identifiability. Meaning that my concept and name of the pillar finds in the pillar something intrinsic that enables me to identify it as a pillar. It has identifiability. So it's language, mind interacts with things through language, concepts. It can be image, it can be a language of images, it can be a language of mathematics, but it interacts with them through language. So the language actually creates the identity of something. This is the bottom line of, so don't be frightened about all this no, no, no stuff, or even your nose. Don't say, I went to a Tibet house to the lecture and I lost my nose. <laughs> don't say it. In fact, what you found was that your nose is your own construction. It's a work in progress, your nose. You create your nose yourself with your idea of a nose. Your idea of a nose, your word nose, and your conceptual image of a nose is what creates the nose. You know this sort of fluid thing that all the dark energy and the dark matter swirling around, which they don't know what it is, is shaped by our ideas of it. This is how the mind does interact with things. Actually, propagandists know this in society. You know, they, 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 this is known. Why do you think there's so much advertising goes on? Why do you think, you know, communist governments, capitalist governments, religious governments are so fanatical about the scripture and the ideology that people must adopt? Because in a way they create their society and they create their self-image of a, like a race or a male or a female or a human being or a person of this class or that class. The concepts do create all these things. They're sheerly conceptually constructed. But sort of at the level of physical reality, people think, well, no, there's sort of some substance there in itself, we think, because we feel we're here in ourselves. The, 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 the root place of this, of course, is about our own self. Anybody who's feeling very relativistic just now, I can, as a thought experiment, just imagine your neighbor turns to you and stamps on your foot. <laughs> it's like, just comes right out of the solar plexus, out of the gut. Like, I have been trampled upon. And the eye seems to just explode. And you'll trample back, or you'll leave, or you'll, you know, whatever, you know. Whatever you, or you'll be a saint, you know, and, <laughs> and say it's okay, or whatever. But it will, it will hit you like it, as an undeniable thing that happened to you. It becomes like an absolute aggression or infringement or a trespass upon you, right? And when you write about something, you really write, right? How many arguments have you had? Remember somebody says, I'd rather, I'd rather be happy than write. <laughs> Me, that's a very good thing. That means they're dropping out of that absolute feeling of being right no matter what. And they say, well, I'd rather be happy. So they kind of get along even with that idiot who's wrong. <laughs> Okay, so the bottom line in the matter is voidness and voidness is matter, one of the bottom lines is, is that since matter is void of itself as an intrinsically real, objective, or identifiable thing, it's only relational and therefore completely shapeable. It's completely, the world is up for grabs. It never is just the way it seems to be. It's always being made and remade all the time. So there is always hope to remake it better. Anything, death even, turns into another life because something continues in it. And actually in time of dreams, in times of after death, in times of sort of out of body transported meditational experiences, that are very easily available to people. You know, reveries, sometimes you go in, you know. Don't do it when you're driving. But people do. And they're sort of not there. Uh, on those places, 
you sort of realize that it's your mind does create whatever it is. Like in a dream, you create a reality, you interact with it, you, all sorts of things happen. While you're in there, you think it's really happening, and you wake up either in a sweat or all in ecstasy, depending on whether it's a nightmare or a bliss dream. But we, we don't want to think, this is a dream, but it is. Or it's not like a dream because we do really bump into the pillar. Or if they do drop a bomb, we really will die and be reborn rather quickly or be in a between state seeking rebirth rather quickly. And, and uh, that's different than a dream where you wake up. To wake up out of the between state is a little more elaborate, usually, unless you're one of those happy campers going to heaven because you've been so generous, peaceful, and patient all your life and kind and you're just wide open and you're ready for something better than the most beautiful room in the Louvre. Monet's water lilies, or the pure land on the Chinese caves or something. Land of the Lotus Sutra. So you're open for just embracing something beyond your imagination, so beautiful and brilliant. Otherwise, something really beautiful and brilliant might frighten someone who's very uptight. You know? They don't want to let go of themselves. So the bottom line is, don't be afraid of emptiness or voidness. It's not nothingness. And in fact, don't be afraid of nothingness because it isn't there. <laughs> and also don't long, now this brings to another point, don't long for nothingness. Transcendence, you know, the, the word for prajna paramita in Sanskrit, paramita means having gone to, a, to the other shore, having gone beyond. So it actually has to be translated as transcendence. It is translated often as perfection by people, but that's also very wrong. There is one young scholar who was commissioned to translate the 8,000 line Prajna Paramita, much longer than this Heart Sutra. And he wants to do transcendence, but there are all kinds of people jumping on him who are used to perfection and they're saying, no, no, you can't say that. Well, you can say transcendent perfection. <laughs> but perfection is something you, you take and you finish. Perfecio, to fully make something. But paramita, does, you don't make going beyond. You go beyond. And there is that double meaning, therefore. Wisdom, we think of a possession of a wise person. But transcendent wisdom goes beyond that person's possession. The person themselves is given to the universe in transcendent wisdom. It's a wisdom where you become the universe. You don't, it's not a wisdom where you know what it is, and you have labels, and you've got it all organized, you have a theory that knows what it is. No, that's not wisdom. Wisdom is when you become everything. That by giving, by transcending your habitual self, by expanding beyond your skin, your boundary between self and other, where you are you and it's all not you, you have to transcend that. Now, on the other hand, when you do that now, you all know something about what I call individual vehicle Buddhism. Some people derogatorily call it lesser vehicle. I, I don't like to do that. I call it individual vehicle. An individual is less than the entire all sentient beings. Yes, it is less. But still, all sentient beings is constituted by individuals. So if you have a vehicle for the liberation of all sentient beings, you have to do individual by individual, which is why there's no real, the, the, the universal vehicle, Mahayana, has no, nothing against the monastic vehicle. And so the individual vehicle is perfect because universal needs an individual vehicle. Do you follow? But the individual vehicle was where Buddha taught people who couldn't imagine that this here now could be blissful and free of suffering if they only were not trapped in their intrinsic reality habit about themselves and the others. If they were free of that misperception, misknowing, wrong knowledge, like, I know I'm not you. Come on. You know you're not me. We know that. In fact, we think, I'm absolutely me, and you think, you're absolutely you. And when we say absolutely, we use it kind of lightly. Like you say, do you want a little sugar in your tea? Absolutely. <laughs> but actually, you couldn't put sugar in your tea absolutely, because absolute means non-relational. So it could never reach your tea. 
<laughs> but we just say it as an emphasis thing. But it also fits with the way we interact with the world where we are absolutely different from everybody else. Don't get in my space. Don't trample on my aura. Don't step on my toe. I uh, you know, don't know my boundaries, you know. This is me, you know. Mm. So, so, yeah, so they couldn't imagine that there's a way of being here where you are the whole thing and everyone else is you at the same time. And it isn't just, we couldn't, people can imagine in, in some extraordinary experience for a while being in love. Holding a baby for the first time, one's, one's own, you know, father or mother, if they're open beings. You know, sometimes part of team or, unfortunately, actually part of mob sometimes. But sometimes people do feel part of a larger, they, they expect, human being is capable of expanding their sense of identification. Sometimes for good and not, some, not so good, but human being can. So we can imagine that. But then imagine if you suddenly felt Right now, imagine you suddenly felt you were everyone in this room. You suddenly felt that. You had like a strange experience where you weren't quite sure which one you were. <laughs> Actually, that happens when the Dalai Lama teaches what's called the great compassion teaching of Shantideva called the equal exchange of self and other. People do have that kind of weird feeling like, which one in here am I? <laughs> they do. They kind of like it, but they're a little, it's a little also disorienting. So they, they're like, uh, whatever. But they temporarily feel that. And then they're nice to the person sitting next to them. If they've been, <laughs> if they've been putting their elbow over on the seat, they will move it. You know, not to bug. But imagine that you were like that. So this, some kind of people can't imagine that. So then they think transcend. Well, then that fits with the fact that I am having a hard time being just myself here inside my skin. People do know that. People are not that happy about it. They know that other people don't really think they're as important as they think they are. We all know that. We know. Some people are reassuring us, trying to, oh, yeah, I care about you. you know, and they do now and then for different reasons. But everybody knows that they're sort of on their own in a certain way. And it's difficult. And then as you get older and older, and it doesn't function so well, this and that, and you have hard knocks, and you lose this, and you lose that. It gets more and more difficult. So then they think transcend, wow, nirvana. If somebody encouraged me, there's such a thing as nirvana. In other traditions, there's heaven. It's paradise. Those poor, misled, theologically misled young Muslims think that blowing themselves up, they'll be up there with 72 virgins. You know, I don't know. They, they're unskillful people. They're up there. I don't think they're going to have fun. And what the females think who blow themselves up? They don't have 72 weird guys who are not going to bother them? <laughs> what do they tell them? I don't know. I think it's quite opposite from what the males think, which they don't know, have any idea, I think. But anyway... They're, so they have ideas of some place that isn't this difficulty, where like everybody's for you or something, you know, where you're all of it or something like that. They can imagine that, but to them it has to be some other place. So therefore, the Buddha let them feel. He didn't tell them matter is voidness and voidness is matter. He didn't. He said matter is kind of a bore, and matter is trouble. And I know that you banged into a lot of things, and your body is corrupting and falling apart and making you difficulties, and you feel sick, and you get old. So matter, you can transcend matter. But the mind then has these spaces of fantastic, calm, meditative, contemplative vastness. And then something even more vast than that is nirvana, which I have discovered. And no more birth, no more being struggle in life, you be free. And then that's imagined. Then they don't say matter. They say that the samsara is void. The samsara is gone, and you can transcend to nirvana outside samsara. And all those Burmese teachings and Sri Lankan teachings and Thai teachings nowadays, and the Tibetans also have that teaching, and the Chinese and everybody, even those that have the, also the other teaching, and they think it's important for some people who could not imagine that nirvana is right here and now. 
If you really knew what the Heart Sutra is saying, no, no, no this, no that, you would be in nirvana because you would be blown away. You know, we do know it. We say it aesthetically, right? How, what happened to you at the concert? I was blown away. That meant I transcended my normal grumpy feeling and I temporarily was like out of myself and it felt good. I felt good, like James Brown, right? I feel good, you know. <laughs> Didn't know that I would, or did he know that he would? I forget. <laughs> Maybe I knew that I would. Maybe he says. <laughs> so, you know, we have these little jolts of being, uh, like, temporarily relieved from our normal self-preoccupation, self-enclosure, like, struggle with, therefore, the vaster world that is unconquerable by us and can't really be that fended off by us. And you know, it's like really hard to deal with. And something blows us away, you know. So, but that there would be a way of staying in it and blown away, even though we have those little hints, we can't imagine. It's hard to imagine. So for them and for us, if we're like that, Buddha lured us with a nirvana feeling that there's some transcendent place. And the word transcendent means it's beyond. Right? But then when he came to Prajnaparamita transcendent, and actually you reach it by wisdom, he said. So that Theravada, you know, Burmese, Sri Lankan, etc., those Theravada teachings and Mahasangika, there's other versions than the Theravada, the dualistic, what I call dualistic Buddhism, meaning there are two realities kind of ultimate. There's really ultimate samsara, world of suffering, and there's an ultimate world apart from suffering, and they're apart, they're different, and you've got to go from one to the other. That's the whole plan, you know, in the Theravada. But then the Mahayana is contradicting that. Because matter is voidness. Matter right here with this matter. And the matter itself is voidness. Voidness, in a way, is nirvana. It's freedom. And the matter is that freedom. And we are all the matter, actually. When Avalokiteshvara had that realization, when Buddha entered that illumination of the profound, when Sharaputras, when he said, no this, no that, no the other, he was no attainment and no non-attainment. Notice, he said, no non-attainment. By that attainment, he meant, people imagine attainment is a place they get that is apart from everything and apart from their old mind and being, and they're really <clears throat> elsewhere. And so he says, no. But then, no non-attainment means that we are already attained at all, right here and now. It's all attained. If you attain nirvana, what happens is you realize you always were there. So you're also right here. You're just right here in a different way. Theoretically, I'm saying. I haven't done it, so I hope that's correct. I, if I disappear, I'll be happy to do that then, too. But I'm just saying, theoretically, that's the case. Because it's, it's defined as uncreated, unmade, beginningless. It's always been here, in other words. Right? So it's only by ignorance that we think we're not in it. Okay, royal reason of relativity. You know that things are relational which because they are empty of any non-relational component, such as intrinsic reality, intrinsic objectivity, intrinsic identifiability, intrinsic referentiality, or anything intrinsic, independent, that things come out of themselves, that they're sort of self-constituting independently, and yet they're still a thing. You follow? All things are relative, right? You know that because they're empty of any such non-relative element. Now, we kind of, it's interesting, our modern world is so incredibly nihilistic. We're all convinced by scientists, quote unquote, that we won't exist just by dying. So we live very casually and devil may care and what the hell and go for the gold and go for the miller and go whatever. Because the worst that can happen is we will just become the nothing that is the reality you get reduced to just by your brain stopping, just by dying. We're all told that. It's all inculcated. We may go to church, synagogue, temple, Buddhist center, but our reality sense is formed in decades of schooling by, and scientists and writers pumping it out from MIT and Harvard Press, this and that. Yes, we know you're nothing. 
Yes, we know you're nothing today. So just don't worry about it. Fly your F-16. Whatever. Be a daredevil. Just, you know, be reckless. Because ultimately there's no consequence to anything. It's meaningless also. No teleology. That was those weird church people. All those crazy people that don't get on Bill Maher's show. You know, there was a purpose to something. No way, it's a soul, whatever, random mutation. And it's an accident that it happened. And maybe it only happened here. On this one little part of the, 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 the uh, one little tiny little nebula, Milky Way, like a little dot somewhere. Suddenly we got this problem, but luckily, don't worry, because we're really nothing. That's what they're telling you. It's total BS. And I don't mean Buddhist studies. <laughs> It is BS. Nobody knows that. They don't know that. They didn't discover that. It's just whistling in the dark. Walking past the cemetery and hoping that Uncle Joe is not in hell from killing too many Indians. And that they won't be wherever it is from whatever they did. It's just nonsense. The natural common sense thing is to expect your experience to continue. You try every night to annihilate yourself. Even without Ambien, whatever, you know, Tylenol, PM, whatever. You want to be unconscious after being awake for a period of time. Clunk. And you keep waking up. It's so annoying. And then there's no, and sleep was like no time at all. Long night, six hours, eight hours. It's like nothing happened. You were, that blissful feeling of not being there, you don't get to enjoy. Because it's like, bing, the alarm goes off and you're up. Really irritating. <laughs> and so what makes you think there's the big sleep waiting for you just in some cemetery in New Jersey? <laughs> just because it's called heavenly rest. <laughs> and the mafiosis are there, you know? They're out there, like, sleeping. Doesn't matter how many people they shot, killed, whatever they did. They're still nothing, just like you. This is nonsense. We're here for the duration, guys. Your sensitivity is here for the duration. Luckily, if Buddha's right, you can make it blissful forever if you understand it. Unfortunately, he doesn't think God did it. He can't do it for you. Nothing, no drug, no nothing, no experience. But your understanding. You can understand it, it will be all right. But you have to understand it. Isn't that a total bummer? You guys thought you graduated from schools, right? You're real grown up people. You work. You're making a living. You're saving your pennies, paying your mortgages, whatever it is you're doing, hoping that they won't rob your pension. The activist hedge fund people. But the point is, you're, we're here forever. Our sensitivity is here forever. And, and even if you read the Book of the Dead, it says, oh, if you enter the clear light, then you know more rebirth. It still carries over that transcendence language. Or transcendent wisdom, it seems like, oh, that's a wisdom where I transcend that. I don't have to bother with this stuff here. But transcendent wisdom is not, is not that you went somewhere else. It's that your, your sense of your wisdom, your self-centered wisdom is transcendent. So wisdom itself, as, a, as the possession of someone, is transcendent. That's what transcendent wisdom is. Music provided by Tenzing Chogel. Used with the artist's permission, all rights reserved. To learn more, visit TenzingChogel.com.
This podcast is made through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Complete listing of all upcoming Robert Thurman events, please visit BobThurman.com. And for upcoming events in the heart of the Catskills in Phoenicia, New York at Menla, please visit Menla.us, located just two hours north of New York City.